I really wasn't expecting to be called a biohacker, but uh, I don't mind. Let me give you a little tour of my world. I'm a cell biologist and a genetic scientist, which means practically almost nobody understands what I do. <laughs> and that's because this is an invisible world to most people. As you zoom in, you know, you, it takes light microscopy just to get down to the level of seeing microbes. It takes electron microscopy to get down into my world of chromosomes, of viruses, and, and ultimately the subcellular systems that power all living things. So this is just, all the physics are weird at this scale. People just aren't trained at this scale because we've only had it available to even to look at for less than 100 years. This is a cartoon of a single human cell and an electron micrograph of some cells. This is the most powerful and complex machine in the known universe. We, we can't model a single cell yet on supercomputers. And yet this machine does fantastic, compu really, uh, computations all day long, runs on sugar, lasts a long time, and it makes more of itself. But we're starting to decode some of its systems, as you know. Biochemists gave us the basic wiring diagram of metabolism decades ago. And now with DNA sequencing, the Human Genome Project, etc., we're actually getting a look at that code. What we're learning, actually, is that the cellular architectures in our bodies are actually very similar to the computer architectures we've been building. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's built on components that come together to make circuits, then very, very complicated circuits, ultimately producing the processor that is the cell. And those cells link up to form networks, local area networks, which in biology are organs and tissues, and then wider area networks, which are our bodies. My body, your body, has roughly 40 trillion cells more devices, more, com more com connected computers than the entire internet. So this is a very complex machine, and we are going to be decoding it for a very long time. This is what the program looks like for a human. 23 chromosomes, metaphase in this case, about six gigabytes of data. In other words, about one movie you may have you know, on a DVD at home. This is a bacterial genome. It's like someone squashed a bacteria. That's its guts. Uh, that's about five megabits of data, about the same as one digital photograph on your phone. And the ones that I'm most interested in are these guys. These are virus particles, about 30 nanometers in size, quite small, typically about 100,000 uh, 100, bits of data. And they can get as small as 5,000 bits of data and even below. So really, really tiny. These are the apps of the biological world. They're actually kind of like the data packets. I work for a software company called Autodesk. Most people know Autodesk. It's been around for a long time. Uh, for our AutoCAD products, which are really used for designing buildings and architecture. But we make a lot of other tools for visualizing and simulating and doing complex analyses. So we kind of touch pretty much everything today in digital fabrication. And we even have a large consumer group now uh, because digital fabrication with 3D printing is becoming available to almost anyone. My five-year-old niece has a 3D printing class. I know, it's kind of wild. And then, of course, you know, for things like visualization, it's also used in movies quite a bit. We just opened a new facility in San Francisco called Pier 9, which is a big shift for us because now that everyone is a maker, we need to get out of just making software and understand the entire making path. So now we have this wonderful facility, bits to atoms, really, you know, where we have designers and artists and printers of all different sizes. We have a great fab lab as well as desktop printers. We even have large <coughs> milling machines, all computer controlled, which is really great if you want to be cutting three inch thick steel. Um, but we also have this facility. We have a laboratory. 
And I believe this is probably the first life science lab ever created by a software company. But it's, it's really a lab to study labs because everything is getting digitized today. This is the home of our bio nano programmable matter group at Autodesk, which is only about two and a half years old and has really been exploring digital biology. The programmers that we have in the group are building something called Project Cyborg. It's still a project, it's not the market name. It'll get cleaned up, I'm sure. But, but what Project Cyborg is trying to do is build a digital platform for all the scientific software that's written around the world for bio-nano applications by really smart people all over the place, but not generally supported as a, as a product. It's written for PhDs, it's written by students, it's written for particular applications. We want to give it a digital home and make it easy for people to start to connect different things. So it's a pretty ambitious project. It's, we've been developing it for a couple of years, but here's an example of what it might change. This is what a researcher might take you know, photographically. This is a virus binding to an E. coli bacteria. It looks like a photograph from the 1850s, but this is really kind of state of the art, you, you know, on an electron microscopy front. This is what you can do with software. Oh, my goodness. Is it moving? Uh, it's probably not going to move. If it can go back, yeah, it's not going to play. But anyway, like you can actually model the entire thing and, you know, and make it real. You can actually get a sense of what it's like to be that molecular object. You can even use Oculus Rift and fly around like a, like a video game. But the important thing is, it's not just all virtual anymore. You can actually end up connecting printers to these software tools today. This is what we're learning with 3D printing and digital fabrication. But there are 3D printers now that print cells. One day we'll be able, we could be able to print organs and tissues. We may even be able to pr print little robots. I work with a printer called a DNA synthesizer. It's the most interesting printer I've ever found because it takes digital files and actually turns it into DNA. And this is where I've been focusing my work. I used to work for a large biotech company. And one of the things that really frustrated me was that I didn't see a lot of progress being made, particularly in things like cancer. I think cancer is actually a fairly easy disease. When you think about it, it's kind of like an infection in your body, but with your own cells. And, you know, 100 years ago, we'd get infections with bacteria and we'd die. And then we got antibiotics and all those problems just went away. So I'm pretty sure that if we start making better medicines, cancer just goes away as a problem too. The problem that, you know, that we have today is the medicines that we have for cancer are really toxic. It's carpet bombing. Uh, it kills all fast growing cells. But we're starting to get medicines today that are really, really precise and targeted. There's a few of them out there that just give breathtaking results when used, very similar to what people must have thought of with penicillin versus infections not so long ago. So I just think we need a lot more medicines fast if we're going to beat cancer. And they have to be personalized because no two cancers are the same. It's your cells infecting your body. But here's the problem. This is a graph of the number of drugs produced per billion dollars of R&D invested over the last 60 years. And it is a negative slope on an exponential graph. So this is the exact opposite of Moore's law. It's Eroom's law. It is not a problem with one company. It's not a problem with one country's IP laws. It's not a problem with anything that we can fix. It is a problem with an industry, with a paradigm. And it's not just cancer drugs that aren't being made, it's drugs for every medical ailment. So I'm on a quest to reboot drug development as my goal in cancer treatment and making the world better. So a few years ago, I started an open source drug company called the Pink Army Cooperative. It's not that big a deal. It's a virtual biotech company, but it was really before the days of crowdfunding. But the things that I really love about this company is it's a hack on drug development. Because we said, well, we're not going to make drugs for everyone. We're going to use these digital genetic engineering technologies, and we're going to make drugs for one person at a time. 
That gets you around doing large clinical trials, which is the most slow and expensive part of getting a drug approved in the current paradigm. To do a drug for one person, though, you need a technology that can make a drug that's effective and cheap. So that's why I work, that's why I do the work that I do. I'm trying to drive the cost down and all this stuff. I'm trying to make specifically 3D printed cancer fighting viruses. You can make really weak viruses that won't infect normal cells. They just, we have defenses against viruses in our bodies. It shuts them down. But cancer cells are broken. And these viruses, when they infect a cancer cell, hack it, take it over, start producing more viruses, kill the cancer cell, and release more viruses in the body to go and kill more cancer cells. It actually hacks the cancer to become the drug plant. They're really quite sweet. They're called oncolytic viruses. I was inspired by this paper 10 years ago. It's actually by a, a, a famous genetic scientist, Craig Venter, and his scientific working partner, a guy named Ham Smith, a Nobel Prize winner, and they made the second synthetic virus in the world. Now, it's not a cancer-fighting virus. It's actually a bacteriophage called Phyx-174. And this is a diagram from that paper, but it's actually fairly simple. They basically designed the viral genome on computer. They printed the DNA synthetically. So there was no biology to start with. They printed the DNA, and then they booted that DNA and made virus particles. And it was a really big deal in 2003, but it only took them two weeks. It was expensive. I don't know how much, but they did it. So last, earlier this year, I decided to see if I could repeat that work without inventing anything, without having a Nobel Prize winner. This is the genome of Phyx-174. Today, five years ago, you could not print this genome very easily. It really took a lot of work. Today, we were able to model this, this virus quite easily. We were able to take that DNA code and actually send it off. Well, actually, we printed the virus as well, 3D printed, it's easy. But holding a virus in your hand is really cool. Some people actually thought this was infectious. <laughs> then I sent the DNA code to about a half dozen different DNA printer companies. And this company in particular was able to get the DNA to me really fast and really cheap and print the entire genome, which we booted in a small procedure in the lab and produced Phyx-174 virus. Wherever you see a spot here, that's where a synthetic virus is booted up. I did it in two weeks, which is, again, I didn't beat the time, but it was only $1,000 all in, and I'll never pay that much again because the cost of writing DNA is falling really quickly, just like the cost of reading DNA. So this is, as far as I know, the first synthetic virus Autodesk has ever produced. Caught a lot of attention, and now I just have to swap out the design to start making cancer-fighting viruses. We've been also working with other folks, like Sean Douglas at UCSF, who's designing kind of a synthetic virus. He calls them cancer-fighting nanorobots, but these are essentially you know, fully artificial you know, designs built on using synthetic DNA as well. They're quite powerful. So we're starting to see the day now where digital pharma is booting up. We're just with a laptop and some of the tools that are becoming available, you can actually make powerful drugs that once only drug companies could do at incredibly low costs. I think in the next two to three years, I should be able to make a virus for about a dollar. This opens up not just cancer therapeutics, but personalized antibiotics, rapid vaccines, diagnostics of all different types, gene therapies for one-off diseases, even really novel biomaterials. And of course, it means that people are going to start hacking this as well. So last year, my writing partner, a guy named Mark, Mark Goodman, who is a cybercrime expert, and I started brainstorming. We started to think of some of the easy hacks in this. But, you know, the only thing I can say that's reassuring is we actually have state-of-the-art defenses. It's called our immune system. It's actually fairly hard to hack biology. This little guy, though, 
is waking up a lot of people to the need that we have to think differently about viruses and microorganisms as we have in the past. If you don't recognize this, it's the Ebola virus. We'll get through this infection, but moving forward, we're going to have to start leveraging these digital technologies better because you, we don't know how to track this information. We go and we sneeze at the doctor, we have a fever, we get sick. They don't know what you have, whether it's the flu or Ebola. That has to change, and it will be these digital technologies that do it. We're already using phones to be able to track outbreaks just by self-reporting. We can make this much more fine resolution. This is just Google's location tracking off of Android phones. I have apps on my phone that track where I go. And you can even get now, for a couple hundred dollars, state-of-the-art military-grade heat sensors, which I could, should be using to see if any of you have a fever. But moving forward, it'll probably be possible to actually make a drug with your phone, too. Because all of these technologies that I'm talking about, right now, it's a small lab, then it gets to be a box, and then it gets to be a little tiny brick, and then it goes on a chip. Finally, I'll just say that Autodesk has opened up all of its software for free for every student and faculty and institution in the world. This was just done a couple of weeks ago. Uh, now it's global. Um, so if anyone wants to use our software and is a student or faculty member, please just go to this website. You're welcome to download anything that we make. And, uh, you know, keep your eyes open to some really awesome new medicines in the future because now every researcher can be a drug company too. Thank you. Um, amazing work, Andrew, kind of mind-blowing. Um, but we have to look at the Hollywood bad guy scenario and the fact that once these tools are democratized, we can't control how they're used. If you were advising the president, the prime minister, on biodefense, what would you suggest that they look at? So the very first thing that we have to... We have some pretty decent blocks actually going from the virtual to the physical. Um, the, every sequence that goes into a synthesizer gets scanned. So no one can print Ebola or smallpox or even the flu. Um, but where we really need to start changing the way we look at the world is we have to have better biosensing. We, in every room we have smoke detectors. We have no biosensors. And it's, it's, to me, that's astounding in this day and age that we don't have a rapid way of looking at, well, do you have Ebola or do you have the flu? You know, we're still doing temperature sensing. You know, we're still asking, have you traveled to Africa? So we, we really need to get a complete digital upgrade in, in our ability to look at the nanoscale in the microbial world. Um, and we need to change the way we educate and regulate these areas. And until we do that, should we be losing sleep, worrying about the risk? No, if anything, these digital technologies actually provide the opportunity for more oversight than we've had in the past. There's been bioweapons programs around the world for years and various conventions and people have broken them. But, but now that they're digital, uh, it's really hard to hide your tracks, as we know. Um, so, so there's more opportunity for surveillance than ever before and for tracking. I think we have plenty, again, our immune systems are very good at fighting most of these things. And I think we'll get better at making, uh, we're already able to use these tools to make synthetic antibodies, one of the first lines of response. Um, as as well as synthetic vaccines. Uh, uh, there was a paper published by Craig Venter last year along with Novartis where they could take a new flu um, and, and make a digital, uh, make a synthetic version of it um, for a vaccine production, hand it off in less than 72 hours. So that's really remarkable. These are not, you know, these are specific vaccines and we should be able to get those, you know, those types of production scales down, you know, to, to even shorter periods of time and distributed globally, so. Amazing talk, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, sir.